Well, I guess we'll go ahead and do it anyway. Welcome to uh, Music Off the Record, and Happy Leap Day. It only happens once every four years, right? So, um, that, people are confused, yeah. So, um, just, I think most of you are here already know, but uh, that my wife is very pregnant and due today, so I'm leaving my phone on, which I usually never do, but if it rings, if it's her, then I guess we'll deal with it from there. If it's somebody else, we'll just hang up and hope that they're not persistent. <laughs> So we'll talk a little bit about some music and uh, hopefully you enjoy it. All right, so uh, the title of the concert that we're talking about, uh, the music for, is called Mass in Time of War. David Lockington's coming to conduct that. That's in a couple weekends here, not this weekend, but the following March 11th through 13th. And the music that we'll cover is up there, and I believe that's the order of the concert, but we're actually gonna talk about it flip-flopped, which is chronological order of when it was written, starting with the, the bottom and heading upwards. So. That's an exciting title. Haydn's original title was Misa in Tempori Belli, uh, which means mass in time of war. So we have the war, we have some mass looking people. So I don't know, it seems like an exciting title, except for it doesn't sound very warlike, doesn't it? Maybe it's just Italian to me, Misa in Tempori Belli. So we get uh, some other names for it. It also is known as the Pauken Messe, which uh, Pauken is referring to the timpani. Uh, and it has a bunch of timpani in it, in movements in particular that there's not usually a bunch of timpani in the mass. And so it gets nicknamed Pauken Messe. Messe just meaning mass, Pauken meaning the drums there. Or in English, and for our concert, Mass in Time of War. It just sounds much more exciting than Misa in Tempori Belli. So it did happen in Time of War, a war that looked more like this than that first one. Um, coming up to the French Revolution, the wars that kind of, uh, that were leading up to it. So. Uh, this was written in 19, or sorry, 1796 in Vienna. So there's a little view of Vienna at the time. So uh, Napoleon isn't in charge of things yet. He's a young commander and he's in charge of a branch that is basically knocking on the door of Vienna coming from the south and west sort of thing. Uh, at the time in Austria there is uh, a fellow who's job title is Royal Paymaster for the War. That's the job. Uh, and he is the proud father of a newly ordained priest. His son is being ordained to be a priest. Uh, this is a very prestigious family in Vienna. Of course, they want to celebrate. Uh, and so in order to do that, they, uh, they commission a mass, a musical mass setting for the celebration of that ordination. So in other words, this is for an actual mass service that they're commissioning the music to be written and they commissioned that from the composer Haydn, who we'll talk about here in a second. And we've talked about before in some of these mass and time Oops, I got a little ahead of myself there. <clears throat> All right, so Franz Josef Haydn, poor country boy from a town called Rohrau. It's my best attempt at a German pronunciation uh, in Austria. He starts out as a choir boy. He's got some talent as a kid. Um, <clears throat> and so they realize that this is a great way for him to get an education because it's very different than us uh, here in the United States where church and state or separate, it's the exact opposite. Church and state are very much connected. School is at the church. And so if you can get into the choir, that pays your tuition. And so he gets in the choir, so they head off to, to school. This is a modern picture of the cathedral, so you see the modern stuff down there. But um, anyway, they, uh, they, uh, it's, a, it's kind of a boarding school. It's mom and dad drop him off and don't see him for a long time. <clears throat> so he's a very talented young man. He's learning a lot about music. He's doing very well uh, studying music there at St. Stephen's Cathedral. But he has some problems that come when he hits puberty. His voice cracks. You know that uh, thing that makes it hard to sing very well uh, for teenage boys. This results in him being kicked out of the choir. And of course, uh, no choir means no tuition. Remember, poor country boy, the only reason he could afford to go to school in the first place was because of his voice. So no voice equals no choir equals no tuition, and this means he's booted out of boarding school and is on the streets of Vienna. Now this seems harsh to us today, but realize that voices changed later than, than they do now. The voice change has happened earlier and earlier through the last century or so. <clears throat> so whereas today, you get boys' voices changing at uh, you know, 12, 13, um, which seems awfully early for somebody to be out on the streets trying to look for a job. 16, 17, even 18 years old for voice changes back then. Uh, it's been an issue with like the Vienna Boys Choir who used to have a lot longer with these boys to develop them and now they, they change so early. 
So anyway, he's got to get a job. And he gets a job. He's uh, just a, you know, a kid himself. He gets a job with a middle class family. They've got a spare room. And they say, all right, you can stay here. And we'll feed you. And maybe a little, little bit of money besides that. And your job is to teach the kids and the family music lessons. And uh, so he's doing that. They brag about what a wonderful teacher they've got. And so, of course, it's a bad idea because somebody else with more money hires him away. <laughs> And this actually happens several times of some person bragging how great a music teacher they've got and somebody hires, somebody hires him away until he lands the big job with the Esterhazy family. Now, this is the royal family of the Hungarian Empire. So, um, well, let's just take a look at their humble home to get a grasp of where Haydn is now working in somebody's home teaching the kids lessons. There's the side view of the home, humble abode there. There's the front view of the Estrahazi Palace. Here's the aerial. Nice little front lawn there as well. This is your in-home theater. You have an in-home everything if you're the Estrahazis. You don't have to leave the house to go to church. Church is in the palace. Theaters in the palace. Anything else you'd like? It's in the palace. I try to remember the number. It's something like 176 guest rooms. I mean, it was, it, it's massive. Um, this is still regularly performed in this hall, this hall that Haydn composed for. Uh, apparently, it's an acoustically wonderful space. Raved is one of the best acoustical spaces to perform in. So anyway, <clears throat> in addition to that humble home, they also have a little summer cabin. There's some great stories about Haydn and his musical adventures there, but we'll save that for another day. All right, so there's uh, Prince Esterhazy there up, uh, Prince Nicholas Esterhazy there up at the top, and Haydn was very much a servant. In other words, we think of musicians as these celebrities and these artists and geniuses and stuff. At the time, he was a servant, just like the cook and the blacksmith and everybody else. And so he had a dictated uniform he was supposed to wear. You know, he was supposed to report to His Highness at a certain time to find out what music His Highness would like, uh, all these kinds of things. So the music he wrote was not, he was never doing this you know, wonderfully expressive music to express his own feelings. That really wasn't the point for him. It was music on demand. It's what, what is the feeling that the prince wants, and he had to be able to write expressive music for that uh, sort of an idea. So he wrote for uh, Prince Nicholas, uh, symphonies, concertos, lots of orchestral music. Prince Nicholas played an instrument and lots of concertos for that instrument. Um, and so he used them quite a lot. He was the music lover of the family. Well, then Nicholas died. The next to reign is Anton. He's in charge. And he's not really uh, into music like Nicholas was. So Haydn is still on the payroll, but they never really ask him to do much. So Haydn you know, gets kind of bored. He leaves and goes and writes some symphonies to perform in London. If you've heard of Haydn's London symphonies, that's where those, that's when, how those come about. Paris, he goes to Paris and does something there because nothing to do back home. That's not really Haydn, this yawning that just, you know, looks kind of like him. So uh, he's there. Well, Anton uh, is gone, and Nicholas II comes to power. Haydn's still around. He's an older gentleman at this point. Uh, but they say, hey, you're on the books anyway, come back and start composing again. But Nicholas II liked sacred music, music for church. And so he's, he's hiring him to compose things like masses and, and motets and oratorios and sacred music rather than the symphonies and things before. Uh, in particular, he starts kind of this tradition that every year for his wife's birthday, he would commission a new mass or a new musical setting for the, for the mass service. Uh, and then that, that was done on the Sunday after her birthday. And so that's where this mass that we're going to hear in our concert uh, came about. It's from those, that kind of tradition. Well, although it's interesting because we already said that he wrote it for that guy whose son was going to be ordained a priest. So Haydn got permission this time rather than writing a new one. He said, can I reuse this one that we just used over here and managed to get permission to recycle uh, his already written mass. <clears throat> he tweaks it a little, you know. He, uh, adds a few instruments in places uh, and uh, tweaks it a little bit, but it's essentially the same thing. So some things to listen for. He opens with something called a French overture. Let's oh, listen to a little bit of it so we can get a feel for what that means. This was something that uh, had been done for a long time, particularly by the composer Jean-Baptiste Lully who was writing opera in the court of King Louis XIV. Uh, and it was this very dramatic thing that apparently they did a lot in their operas, and it became 
uh, kind of a thing, and so we see it happen quite a bit. So let me play the beginning and see if we can hear what it is that's this French mass, I mean French overture. So it always starts slow, the French overture does. And it tends to have these long, short, long rhythms. This one's a little more subtle. You hear that long, then da 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 is part of the short. And you even see what they would call dotted rhythms, how the first note has some dots by it, and then the fast note right after it. Key, rie is part of that French overture. So the next thing that happens <clears throat> in that French overture is a fast section. So once the slow section is done, kind of a slow intro, it takes off fast. And so we'll hear that for this piece, that's when the soprano comes in. Hear that in the fast, in the short, long, short, long. So now we're into the fast part with the soprano solo. So, <clears throat> excuse me, you get the slow with the fast, short, fast, I mean long, short, long, short, long rhythms, um, and then taking off in a fast section. So other places you probably have heard French overture, Handel's Messiah, the overture starts off with that dum, ba -da dum, da -da dum, we have the short, short, short longs, uh, and then takes off fast. Uh, Beethoven's uh, Pathetic Piano Sonata, if you're familiar with that, the dum, ba dum, ba da dum, those dotted rhythms, and then takes off fast. Mozart symphonies, his number 39, if you're familiar with that one, does it. <clears throat> Some of Haydn's symphonies. So it's a common device. Now, lots of music has slow introduction. It's the slow, and particularly those short, long rhythms, which apparently were attached to some kind of dramatic gesture in French theater and in French opera in particular that was a uh, you know, considered to be very dramatic. So it was, if you wanted to start something dramatic, you just slow with these jerky rhythms uh, and then take off into where you're headed. <clears throat> All right, so Haydn is a symphonist, right? He's been writing symphonies. I mean, how many symphonies does Haydn have? 109, 108, 109, a lot of symphonies. And so that's what he's good at. And he writes this mass in some ways kind of like a symphony. He creates a symphonic structure around it. Um, Part of that is the first movement of the symphony is always in sonata form. Uh, and we won't read too much about what that means, but just realize that it's going to include two different keys, a contrast between two different keys within that movement. Uh, and although that's maybe a little challenging for some listeners today, that was what was expected at the time, and the listeners were familiar with that, and so they would recognize the key change uh, and then the coming back. So we can hear it a little bit easier in this because of the soloist. So when that soprano jumps in and the fat tempo starts fast, that's the beginning of the sonata form. Soprano sings it in the key of C. So you can see the very first note up there, it's the second space down from the top, and that's where the soprano sings it. Well, then after that we go through a key change, and you know when that comes because that's when there's kind of the whole choir singing and the four solos together, and then that kind of wraps up on the second theme. So there's always kind of two themes that are in different keys in sonata form. And the alto is going to sing it, and it sounds very much the same as the first theme, as what Haydn does here, but it's lower. So you can see on the second line down, starting from the second line up from the top, there's the lower theme. And then, of course, we like everything to be symmetrical in the classical period, so it's going to come right back uh, to that first key and end the same way it began. So we heard the soprano start. Let's listen for a little bit, see if we can hear the altos come in lower, <clears throat> or the alto solos come in lower. Can we get the sound up a little bit? It's awfully quiet. So here's the key change is going to start. You hear them sequencing, they're starting to do that key change. It's 
settling into our new key. So there was our four soloists. There they are again. So by the time they're done, we're firmly into a new key. And we'll hear that as the alto sings the same theme, but it's lower. So the same thing as Fernando saying, obviously lower. So again, for Haydn's audience, they would have expected this and been looking for it. <coughs> uh, and then eventually we'll get the, the theme coming back. When the soprano comes back in, uh, back in the same key that it started, kind of like a recapitulation if you're familiar with the sonata form. If not, don't worry about it. But you can listen for those changes where it changes and comes in lower and changes and comes in higher. So <coughs> again, try to make it like a symphony. Haydn symphonies typically have three to four movements. They have different temping, in other words, some slow, some fast, that sort of thing, in different keys. So there's just a quick layout of a Haydn symphony. Starts fast in the key of F, slow in the key of C, medium in the key of F, and fast in the key of F. So one contrasting key, some contrasting things. So to compare that, uh, we've got this for the mass. Now obviously it's much longer, much more going on there, and there's a lot of information up there, but uh, if you can see just that kind of second column in there that has our keys, lots of C major, but we have the contrasting A major in the middle there. Uh, and then a C minor uh, and an F major. And so there's a, some contrasting there. Likewise, you see the similar patterns that we have fast, and then we have slow, uh, and then back and forth, and some medium in there. So it's similar. He just has to do it over a, a bunch more. Um, one thing is you listen to this, if you go to this concert, or just if you listen to a recording, you'll notice that there's amens in the middle of this thing. Where, do, where are amens supposed to come? At the end, yeah, amens are supposed to come at the end, so how come there's so many amens in the middle? Well, there's, there's a good reason for that. So, first of all, we're talking about this Catholic Mass. There's certain parts of it that are set to music, and those parts are called the ordinary, and there's five of them. And they start with those words. And so usually a Mass would be five movements instead of our 11 that we have here. And uh, Haydn has broken up some of these sections. They call it a cantata Mass, but anyway, uh, the part that is the second one, the Gloria, he breaks that into three chunks and does a C major, A major, back to C major. So some little, you know, contrast within it. Uh, and then at the end of that big, he's turned the Gloria into a big deal with three movements, and then he ends it with an Amen. Does that make sense? Does the same thing too that's usually the Credo, the third one. He says, all right, let's split the Credo up into three parts, and then there's some Amens that you'll hear at the end of the Credo. The other and a more important reason for that is that, remember, this was going to be sung at the mass service for the prince's wife's birthday, in one case, or for, in fact, the very original one, at the mass service where the priest was ordained, right? The son of the guy who, who commissioned it. So um, there was actually a, a mass going on. And so it was not a concert work. In other words, this wasn't like we're going to hear it, which we sit and listen to a concert the whole time. There was a church service going on, and so there was some of it that was sung. We get the Kyrie and the Gloria song, Amen, and then there's spoken stuff going on. There's, there's church stuff going on, and the choir sits down, and the musicians are done for a bit. And then it's their turn again. They get the credo, and they have that broken up into three things, and they Amen, and they're done. And then there's you know, church stuff going on. So the biggest reason that there's Amens in the middle is that Haydn never intended for us to sit through this thing all back to back in a concert. It was supposed to be part of a religious service. So that's always an interesting kind of fact that today you usually hear these not in a religious service but in a concert setting and kind of realizing that they were broken up with a different expectation uh, as far as how they were composed. So any questions on the Mass in Time of War? No? Let's uh, listen to maybe just a couple more couple more little movements from that before we jump on to the next thing just so we can hear some more of things. So we mentioned that Gloria that gets broken up into different pieces in the Amen. So here's how the Gloria starts. So 
So you hear the full orchestra, the big choir, it's in C major. They end and move on to this one. You see big contrast, right? We're actually in a different key. Have a different tempo. We're gonna slow down, take a little break from all that exuberant Gloria in the last movement. soloist. And then still within that big credo that we're breaking up into chunks, here's the third one. Very similar to the first one, right? Again, they like symmetry, so they have something in contrast and bring it back. saying Amen now. So we're the fourth movement out of 11 and we're already singing Amen. But remember that's because this chunk of the Mass was done and the music was done and ready to go on. And so um, that's just kind of part of how the liturgical service was built. All right, moving on to our next piece, the next composer. So this is Mendelssohn, a symphonia in D minor number seven. So first question, what's a symphonia? Well, Early on, it was an overture. It's just an orchestra piece, and it was often used as an overture. In fact, going back to that Handel's Messiah overture that had the French overture, the actual title for that is Sinfonia or Symphony. Uh, but it wasn't the symphony that we usually think of. It was kind of before we actually had the development of what we think of as a symphony today with the multiple movements and all the stuff that Haydn was doing. So back when the Sinfonia started, so you'll get some pieces called Sinfonia that are that. They're early Baroque pieces that are just little overtures, like before Messiah. But by the time Mendelssohn's around, it's kind of a small symphony. So a symphony was a big one. Symphonia is, is a miniature version, both in size of orchestra. This one is for strings only, um, and also in, in length and scope of the piece. So quick little bio on Mendelssohn, born in 1809 in Hamburg. Uh, his father was a banker in Paris. His mother was from a very wealthy family. All this means that Felix is one rich little kid. So that works out well for him. So close, something like that maybe, I don't know. But uh, he, as opposed to a lot of uh, musicians in the 1800s who were the poor, starving, suffering artists sort of thing, uh, he was uh, from a very wealthy family. There is their home, not quite the Esterhazy Palace, but certainly in, uh, in Leipzig, it, in Berlin, I mean, um, it was a, a, a very nice and very large home. They moved to Berlin uh, out of Hamburg uh, to avoid that same conflict that kind of was just getting started when Haydn was writing Mass in Time of War um, in 1796 by you know the first decade of the 1800s. It's become the full-on Napoleonic, Napoleonic Wars and there's you know trouble brewing uh, in Hamburg and so Berlin is further away from it. So that's why they head there. So uh, if you notice the name, if we go back Felix Mendelssohn Bartholdy. You'll see it sometimes with that name on the end, sometimes not. The reason for that is that the family converted to Christianity and added that name, Bartholdy, as part of that. Uh, the reason, hard to say, of course, they said it was for religious reasons. Um, you do sometimes wonder if it was political in nature because of the anti-Semitism that was very strong at this time in Europe, uh, which especially connected with bankers. I mean, historically going back, a lot of, because of laws in Europe and Christianity in medieval times. Anyway, the bankers were all Jews, and who likes your banker? You know, they, you owe them money. <laughs> uh, 
And so, uh, anyway, so perhaps for political reason, for whatever reason, they became a Christian. Later in his life, Felix went back to Judaism and dropped the name. So you'll see it uh, rightly so with and without the name, depending on when it was written, or some people just take it off completely. Uh, but you'll see it both ways. So young Felix and his sister Fanny were both taught by mom uh, in the home, piano lessons, and were just remarkably talented. If there was any, ever anyone who could claim to be the next Mozart, it was Felix. When he's 10 years old, mom realizes, as good of a pianist as she is, that uh, she needs to get her a, a professional piano teacher in here, somebody more than what she can do. Um, the other thing that was happening is that with this wealthy family, um, whenever there were musicians traveling through, uh, they were invited into the Mendelssohn home and they would visit and they'd put on these little informal concerts, something kind of like this. You see young Felix at the uh, keyboard there and other musicians who were maybe traveling through from this gig to that gig would stop by and they'd play with this kid and, and sit there and do informal concerts. And uh, so he was uh, exposed to a lot of great musicians and at, when he's 10, they do hire a very prominent piano teacher to teach him violin teacher as well, and stuff like that too. And he starts composing quite a bit, or I shouldn't say he starts, he's, he's composing quite a bit, so dad says, well, let's hire an orchestra. So this again, shows the affluence of, of the family that dad can say, well, let's hire an orchestra to play your music every week and have some fun. And so they put on these uh, uh, concerts, uh, start putting on these Sunday evening concerts. And during the summer, they put them on in the backyard. Now we see the backyard, he's got seven acres for a backyard, and there is a portico that is seated back there, <coughs> I should say that is built back there. Uh, not this exact one, this is just an image I could find of a portico as an example. Now when I was not unsure if I was going to be here or not because of the baby being due today, um, our orchestra director who was going to come in and stand in for me, he mentioned that there's a building in Tacoma that has a portico that's a little similar to this that he says is a wonderful place to perform uh, the acoustics and things. So apparently there's a similar place in Tacoma somewhere that you can find that, that has a nice place. But they can seat several hundred here in the portico in the backyard to put on these informal concerts that they would do every Sunday with this, you know, preteen up there leading the orchestra and conducting his own music. It's just astounding, isn't it? Remarkable. Well, so for these concerts, he composes 13 symphonias, one of which is the one that we're talking about that we're going to hear at the Northwest Symphonietta concert. So he's 12 to 13 years old when he writes these. Um, astounding. Um, again, for strings only, he never publishes them. Later in his adult, he refused to publish and he was asked about it and he refused. He thought they were just juvenile works. No, I was just a kid. They're not, they're not, you know, they're just, they're just kid stuff. Um, which is funny because they're published after he dies and now they're still, you know, hundreds of years later, still performed widely and enjoyed by people. So we're going to hear one at a concert by this kid who as an adult said, that's just kid stuff. Um, so the uh, symphony itself, Similar in structure to a, a classical symphony like one by Haydn or Mozart. So just like we were looking at Haydn's symphonies to compare it to his mass, same thing you see here, there's four movements. Same kind of structure of fast, slow, medium, fast. That same sonata form, the kind of structure that it's built with is, is there as well. Um, all the kind of pieces of a normal symphony are there. It's just going to be a little shorter than, than you know, Mendelssohn has four big symphonies and it's going to be smaller. Uh, in size and stuff. There's a few things that I wonder if he's heard some Beethoven, because Beethoven's not long before Mendelssohn, and he's got maybe some of that in his ear. For example, that this uh, symphony in D minor ends in D major. So similar to a classical symphony, except for Mozart or Haydn would never do that. That against the rules. D minor, D major, those are two different keys. You can't end in a different key than you start. You have to end in the same one. So. You gotta wonder, and I don't know, but you gotta wonder if, uh, if young Mendelssohn is there and he's heard Beethoven's Fifth Symphony, which is a brand new thing, you know, and he's a, it's a very new and innovative thing, and ooh, it ends in C major. What a great idea. And so here's this kid, he's like, well, I'm gonna do the same thing, and he starts a little symphonia in D minor, and ends in D major in the same sort of way. So the first movement is in sonata form, uh, and follows the typical thing, which has a first theme, which is usually this rhythmic, uh, active theme, and then and we kind of heard just a little bit of them, that very energetic theme. And the second theme, which is typically a little more lyrical um, than the, whoops, than the first theme. So again, anytime you're listening to a symphony, first movement, you ex can expect these things. There's a theme that's kind of energetic, 
and the first theme. Second theme, there's going to be a little more lyrical. They would have called it a feminine theme, not politically correct today, but they would have called it a feminine theme, you know, because all women wore corsets and sighed and passed out all the time, right? So your second theme is going to be very delicate and lyrical. Uh, and then it's going to get this development section where it's going to take bits and pieces of our different themes and move through keys and be a little bit maybe chaotic. And then the recapitulation is where it's going to sound just like the beginning. You're going to get the first theme again, you're going to get the second theme again, and kind of all wrap it up, round it off. So we're expecting that for the first movement. That's what we get with Mendelssohn. Mendelssohn was raised with, of course, the best of education, so his composition was taught as well. He was taught how to write in the same style as Haydn and Mozart and that good classical education. Second movement, we expect a slower movement, something a little more lyrical as well for the whole second movement. Third movement, uh, a minuet. Now, a minuet in the time of Haydn was a dance that all the royal Esterhazy family would have danced to and known the dance, and a dance that was not terribly fast. Beethoven comes along and blows that out of the water and even changes the name from minuet to scherzo because it goes so fast. He still calls it a minuet, but again, you hear Mendelssohn's not so much the, uh, the dance of Haydn's generation, but it's a little more energetic than, than Haydn would do, a, or at least a faster tempo. So as part of that symmetry, when we get to the end, we'd expect that minor to come back, right? Started with minor and then had the happier major middle, come back to the minor. It doesn't. It comes back to the theme, but it plays it in major. So we see he's just young. He's just a 12-year-old, and he's, he's composing what he's learned, uh, not to take away the remarkableness of what he's done when I mean, coming up with themes and composing it and structure it all very good. Um, um, he's not doing a lot of you know, groundbreaking innovation, but you do see him starting to mimic some of the things that he's seen by Beethoven and other composers who are, are being innovative. So he's saying, OK, this is how you push the envelope, so let me try that, too, as a 12-year-old. I mean, it's, it's remarkable. <clears throat> and so he's, he's doing a little bit of things like, well, I'm not going to go back quite to the same key. I'm going to keep it major. I'm going to end it minor, these sort of things. Uh, you see him doing a little bit of that. So um, it's been proposed by some scholars that some of his ideas for the for, fourth symphony, his big symphony, he, that he was working on some of those ideas in this uh, fourth movement of this little symphonia that he kind of was marinating some ideas here and starting to develop them. So, any questions on the Sinfonia or Mendelssohn in general? Great. Moving on, last piece, a little short one. Musica Celestis by a living composer, Jay Kernis, inspired by this medieval musical concept that he had learned in his studies of medieval music, this concept of Musica Celestis or Celestis. Let's uh, learn a little bit about this musical philosophy. Here's the musical philosophy set forth by Boethius in the Middle Ages. There was four types of music. Musica mundana, or music of the spheres. This is music that you cannot hear. This is a musical relationship between the different planets in the solar system. Had all kinds of cool charts like this. Very philosophical, nothing you can hear. Next, musica humana. Maybe we can hear this, yeah? Human music? No. You can't hear this one either. This is a musical performance of the human soul as it resonated with the body. So the workings of the soul and body together created this harmony, and that was musica humana. Other cool charts and hard to understand medieval stuff, connection with that. So we still don't have any music that we can hear. You can't hear this either. So then finally we get to musica instrumentalis. This is what we think of as music. This is music that you can hear, including singing, even though it's called musica instrumentalis. This is music making notes in the air that we can hear. So there's our three main ones, and those are really the three that Boethius talks about. But there's a fourth one uh, as well that was this musica celestis that fascinates our young composer of today. And this is the idea of this mystical song that's, that's created in the heavens by God and angels and is this, you know, in a different sphere of being, I guess you could say, that's eternal and, and all this kind of stuff. So this concept of this eternal music just constantly going up there in the heavens uh, was something that he had discovered in his study of medieval music, in particular the music of Hildegard von Bingen. This is a medieval sketch of her. She was a, an abbess. In other words, she was, you know, in charge of actually multiple convents, uh, and she actually wrote quite a bit of theology as well as composing music, and she was a very prolific woman, uh, quite unique for European history that early to have a woman's name attached to anything, much less as much as she did. So he had been studying her music a lot and, and uh, 
found that fascinating in connection with this concept of musica celestis. So let's put on a little Hildegard. into these charts. <laughs> so something like that. <clears throat> so there's Jay Kernis up there, born in 1960 in Philadelphia. He is one of the youngest composers ever to receive the Pulitzer Prize. Received that in 2003. Uh, he has been commissioned to compose works for the list of names up there, which I'm assuming at least some of them are familiar to most people. Joshua Bell, the violinist, Renee Fleming, soprano. Uh, ensembles like the New York Philharmonic, San Francisco Symphony. So he's well respected as a composer, I guess is the point. Has written some great stuff for some great people. Uh, his current day job is as a professor of composition at Yale. Um, this piece is, uh, that we're going to hear on the concert, Music of Celestis, is often compared to Barber's Adagio for Strings, has not only a similar sound, but a similar background. Barber's Adagio for Strings, that everybody loves, started out as a movement of a string quartet. So did this piece. Starts out a movement of a string quartet. Everybody loves it. He loves it, so he decides to arrange it for a string orchestra, just like Barber did with the Adagio for Strings. Uh, so once he did that, it was premiered in 1992 by a chamber symphony, kind of like our Northwest Sinfonietta, but that's based in San Francisco. Uh, and ever since then, it has been his most performed and most well-known work. Um, also similar to the Barber, has this you know, ethereal quality and, and this kind of constant gradual building to this wonderful climax that everybody loves, which is why it's performed all the time. Let's get to this one. It is very similar in sound to the Adagio for Strings, but I guess I'd say if, if there was something to contrast with it, the biggest difference is you see that Musica Celestis concept of it never quite has a clear-cut ending and beginning. Everything's very organic as it's this, again, concept of music that's always going up there in the heavens and you happen to get a glimpse of it. And so we you see it doesn't quite end, it just keeps going. Whereas Barber sometimes lets us have a breath and start again. Whereas Jay just keeps it going, it's up there, always going. Thank you for coming, or watching as it may be. Um, so again, this is music that will be performed by Northwest Sinfonietta. We're here at Pierce College, um, and it's been uh, exciting to have these two groups together. Sinfonietta uh, does this educational outreach. They come and they practice here. Our students get to listen, and so I'm excited for our students at Pierce College to get to hear some of their work.
So that's all we have for you this evening, unless there's any questions for me. And if not, then that's a wrap. Enjoy the rest of your evening.